Uh, so I'm Jaime Ibanez, former postdoctoral researcher here in Darius Lab, uh, currently in the University of Zaragoza, not also actively working on neural interfaces with uh, with a lot of focus on recording muscle activity and seeing what we can do with that, right? So I believe today's day uh, for today's plan was to give a broad presentation on uh, neuromodulation methodologies that can allow us to, yeah, to guide some plastic changes or guide activity in the central nervous system. Um, that was the agenda for today, you know, always having a bit of a focus on on muscle recordings and how that that how that kind of activity can fit into this framework, right? So uh, st starting from the obvious, of course, we, with that in mind, we, we want to think about uh, which ways can we uh, explore uh, to, to, in, to, to induce changes that can either alter connectivity in the nervous system or, or modify its, the, the ongoing activity in specific structures of the central nervous system, which can have important benefits uh, in different kinds of neurological conditions, and um, especially today, more focused on on motor conditions that are related to yeah a certain lesion in the central nervous system or 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 um, pathological type of types of activity that can affect function in general, right? So for for quite some decades already, there has been quite an intense amount of work dedicated to exploring ways in which we can induce changes. In the central nervous system, uh, particularly using uh, non-invasive methods like, for example, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial electrical stimulation. Everything going well over there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it seems like the, the, the screen is not. Um, let me try. Oh, but it should. It's it should red. Be. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's for the screen. Okay. Maybe now, Alex. Let me check. Is it possible, Alejandro, that uh, we have two different links? I just click on the calendar and I see three persons, and you see more. So. Uh, we have way more in this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, think I don't know where this link. Is. I, I clicked. I clicked on the link in in the calendar. How oh, I tried to try. Okay, so, yeah. you read with the one I sent to the in the last email. Okay. Okay. I will not fight. Please continue. Yeah. I, <clears throat> okay. So where were we? So yeah, finding ways to induce uh, changes in the central nervous system is is a pathway towards improving function in different many different disorders or uh, neurological conditions like stroke, spinal cord injury, uh, hypertonetic disorders, etc., etc. And now one of the, oh, let me, now because I changed the, the way in which this is presented, let me see if I go back to full screen mode, yeah. So one of the most uh, repeated uh, outcomes of these kinds of, of protocols is the fact that we tend to have quite big variability in the, in the uh, induced effects by some of the most classical um, plasticity induction paradigms, right? Like, for example, here in this graph, we see one of the most uh, popular ways of uh, modulating excitability in a certain area of the brain. And we can see how, on an individual basis, we can see very diverging effects of the of this, uh, supposedly working protocol. So we need to find better ways to, to make more targeted and more uh, reliable or robust effects using this kind of technologies, right? So uh, one of the main reasons why uh, it has been um, uh, argued that this, this kind of methods don't work reliably uh, uh, and don't lead to more or less constrained effects is the fact that we typically use the brain as a black box in which uh, we basically just deliver whatever kind of stimuli we, we're thinking of for a given protocol and assume that the effects are gonna be in a, cer in a certain way. But that completely disregards the fact that, um, depending on the kind of state that we are uh, targeting with us with our stimuli, we can be having quite different effects. So the question is whether or not we can use how much we can benefit from having 
uh, identified states that we can target with stimulation and that way we can narrow down the effects in terms of variability and also in terms of the specificity, specificity of the effects that we have induced, right? So we can do this in, in different ways. For example, we can we can try to impose this kind of neural state that we're going to be targeting them with our neural plasticity protocols. And this is kind of the, the protocols that uh, people have been proposing in the past. For example, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, there was this very popular paper using uh, pair associative stimulation protocols in which you deliver uh, a stimulus through uh, peripheral nerves and make it match at the cortical level, at the motor cortex, with uh, stimulus that is being delivered by, for example, a transcranial magnetic stimulator. And they were able to show that by pairing this kind of stimuli, you could uh, produce certain types of changes that could last for a while after the intervention, and they could be certainly specific regarding the kind of stimulation that was being paired with the afferent stimulation through the nerves, right? And there have been other protocols and other versions of this kind of um, paired associative uh, stimulation protocols, like, for example, uh, more recently, uh, this framework published by uh, Karen Bandai and, and Monica Perez, where they were pairing stimuli that caused uh, a descending bullet, bullet from the motor cortex, and this was paired with peripheral nerve stimulation. And this could cause some level of facilitation at the motor neuron entrance, which could be a way of improving uh, the efficacy of transmission between the brain and the muscles in, for example, spinal cord injured patients. And some more recent studies, for example, this one on the right is uh, by Baker's group, and they were showing evidence that uh, by pairing startling stimuli, like very loud noises, uh, while people were moving around and doing daily living activities, and pairing that kind of stimuli with uh, nerve stimulation, they could show evidence that there were some facilitatory effects on specific structures uh, subcortically, which are related to uh, the function of the reticulospinal uh, tract. So uh, altogether, we can we can see these kind of protocols can improve in a certain way related to uh, to the previous ones, uh, just delivering stimuli. Because in this case, what we are doing is we are narrowing down the the structures that are being targeted by stimulation by imposing a certain state that makes only certain pathways or structures sensitive to the stimuli that are inducing and uh, plasticity effects. Uh, we can also, instead of uh, using external stimuli to modulate or, or set a neural state to be conditioned, we can otherwise try to use different types of motor paradigms. So this is a bit of a busy slide. I'm sorry for that. But uh, in, in essence, what it says is that, for example, in, in different motor paradigms where you have people involved in a certain action, like, for example, planning a, a certain voluntary contraction, uh, you can see that there are some uh, dynamics in neural activity that are related to changes in corticospinal excitability and cortical excitability as well. So what that means is that, for example, when you ask someone to prepare uh, for a given action, for example, uh, flexing a, uh, the index finger, and then you, set, uh, you test the excitability of the pathways that connect the brain with, the, with that muscle effector and with other effectors that are nearby but are not being activated, what we can see is diverging uh, trends in excitability showing that uh, the effector muscle is going to show a sudden reduction of excitability followed by a very steep increase in excitability right before the time when um, the muscles get contracted. And this doesn't happen in the other muscles surrounding, which is known, is a phenomenon known as the surround inhibition uh, phenomenon that is supposed to allow us to uh, focalize the activation of specific muscles for a specific function instead of having all muscles in a certain region being activated. But what that means is that basically we can use this kind of protocols, pairing them with certain types of stimuli, using the motor state as a filter that already uh, restricts the structures that are going to be sensitive to the external stimuli that are going to be changing um, certain aspects of, of connectivity, right? Uh, finally, uh, we, we can also think of ways in which we can record specific, uh, properly the activity of the brain. And I think this was one of the main topics of discussion for today, like having uh, ways of recording brain activity and using that to identify given states that can be used either pair them with stimulation so that uh, we can produce certain changes in connectivity or we can either we can otherwise use these uh, estimated states or ongoing activity to determine how we stimulate so that we can drive the activity of the of the brain and spinal cord activity in a certain way right so within this framework um, there's been quite a bit of work uh, 
in the past, I think, probably 40 years already of EEG literature and brain-computer interfacing, where people have been proving uh, or trying to prove different paradigms that allow us to induce plastic changes uh, that can have some relevant outcomes in terms of function improvement in patients. So we've, we've, we recently tried to condense all this literature um, in a structured way, trying to identify the main um, parameters that one can use for these kind of paradigms. And in a, nut, in a nutshell, we, when we can think when, when using uh, uh, EEG based brain computer interfaces for plasticity induction is that we can think of four main paradigms, right? Like uh, we can think about paradigms which are relying on active states of the brain, like for example, with regards to motor function in this case, when subjects are um, in trained in a given action or about to perform a, a given motor uh, action, or those that rely on idling states where subjects are not entrained in a given action of a given structure. And then we can think about uh, paradigms that are using different ways of inducing plasticity, either based on classical conditioning methods or on operant conditioning uh, protocols. So there's quite extensive literature uh, uh, exemplifying each of these quadrants in this plot, uh, and all of them have been trying to push the field towards finding more efficacious ways of inducing plasticity. Here are some of the most classical examples in each of these uh, versions. So for example, um, what is that name? So top left corner, we have these papers mainly by the Tubingen and Kratz groups that have been basically relying on the identification of changes in, in sensory motor rhythms that are a, an indirect way of um, estimating the level of activation of the motor cortex, and if, if we pair that with certain types of stimuli, like sensory stimuli or visual stimuli, we can train subjects to learn to activate these uh, different parts of the cortex. Um, and there are other kinds of paradigms, like bottom left corner, I think Alejandro will discuss that more in detail in, in the next talk, but basically pairing certain types of uh, neural events decoded from EEG and related to uh, motor cortical activation, we can induce certain levels of plasticity. And then on the right, we can think of other types of paradigms that are relying more on the, on the presence and prominence of salient uh, sensory motor rhythms that are telling us uh, important information about uh, fluctuating changes in excitability at the entrance of the, of the pyramidal plaque neurons that connect the brain with the, with the periphery. And that can, that can allow us to um, selectively target how to, how to deliver stimuli. So, then, uh, in parallel with that, there are also um, efforts towards uh, finding ways to identify neural states that can be used to entrain activity, not so much to, to induce plastic changes in the sense of uh, synaptic uh, facilitation, but rather to, to force or to induce certain type of activation or rhythmic activation in the, in the motor cortex and, uh, or other parts of the brain. And here are some examples that have been using EEG to define the frequencies that are being used uh, to to entrain cortical activity, either in the motor cortex at the top, the top right panel, uh, is an uh, a very popular experiment that was done already more than 10 years ago, where uh, these these scientists were delivering transcranial alternating current stimulation in the beta band while subjects were preparing to perform an action. And what they could show is that uh, when when doing this, uh, they could see compared to control conditions that uh, the corticomuscular coherence in the beta band was increased quite uh, significantly in, in the conditions where stimulus was delivered at the, at the frequency of the, of the beta band for each subject. And then this was also related to a reduction of, of the initial velocity with which subjects were able to perform a ballistic task. So they were able to show some level of evidence of entrainment that was also related to function. And in a similar way, other studies have, like for example here at the bottom, have shown evidence of using um, uh, transcribed mag magnetic stimulation-based uh, protocols uh, in which they use bursts of activity at different frequencies uh, to demonstrate that this can lead to changes in the in the frequencies produced by the brain during uh, different types of tasks, and they also related it to function. For example, here in in a task of, uh, and associated with visual perception. Um, so, but these experiments here are all based on open loop stimulation yet. 
So in these cases, what they are doing is recording brain activity, identifying certain um, frequencies that are going to be more frequently observed in certain subjects, and then defining the kind of stimulation that is going to be delivered based on that. Uh, however, then there has been some, not that much, but some evidence that, um, uh, again, going back to the initial slides, uh, when we close the loop and, and try to monitor and track continuously the activity that is being delivered or produced by the brain and, and determine the stimulation based on that, this is going to cause some more reliable effects on, on, on the outcome. And this is, uh, this is a recent paper published by, um, by Schreckman and, and others in Nature Communications in 2021, where they were, instead of recording uh, brain activity, uh, they were using a surrogate of brain activity at the hand uh, level because this was in, in, in subjects uh, producing tremors and what they could show is that when they were using this kind of activity uh, to drive stimulation in this case using cerebellar stimulation they could show that uh, the amount the size of the effects and the stability of the elicited uh, effects uh, in terms of tremor production in this case in these patients was more stable when the closed loop was uh, activated versus when the stimulus was just delivered in open loop, so meaning that it is in this kind of experiment, there's some level of evidence that maybe having a closed loop uh, paradigm where we determine how to stimulate the brain to entrain activity based on ongoing activity is going to have more stable results. Okay, in all these previous cases, we've been discussing um, evidence of of different alternatives in which we can use EEG or other kinds of brain recording methods to determine neural states. And now I'm going to switch into another topic. And this is basically motivated by the fact that uh, the currently existing technologies that we have for brain recordings have several limitations that are hard to overcome, right? So most likely in most cases, if we want to use realistic paradigms based on brain recordings, we're going to rely probably on EEG or related types of technology. And this kind of, this kind of systems, they are uh, pretty much uh, recording activity on the superficial layers mainly. So all these circuits that are closest to, to the scalp where, from which we are recording activity. And they are also severely affected by all sorts of activ uh, or of artifacts. So as soon as we try to think of ways in which we can combine recordings of brain activity with different uh, paradigms of direct brain stimulation, um, the chances that we can track activity at the brain level while stimulation is being delivered is going to be severely damped, right? So, uh, at, the, at present, there are many groups trying to figure out ways in which we can cancel out these artifacts and try to keep tracking this activity. But at the moment, this is this is a, an open issue, and and it's it's well, I, I, I see some people that uh, don't think the same way. But, uh, well, let's just um, accept the fact that there's quite an intense level of work dedicated towards um, removing the artifacts that can be caused by stimulation in the presence of different types of stimulation patterns, right? Um, all right, so now that in line with hybrid neuro, uh, one of the things that we can think of when when working uh, with uh, paradigms in which we record neural activity of the brain to, to deliver stimulus is that instead of using brain recordings uh, to set up or to identify neural states, we can use uh, per, uh, peripheral recordings of muscle activity uh, to infer ongoing activity in the central nervous system, and this can have certain um, advantages compared to direct brain recordings, right? Uh, in line with the limitations we were discussing before. So, what is the rationale for that, right? So, uh, I think Sylvia gave a very nice uh, presentation yesterday on how we can record and how ENG signal is generated from activity of motor neurons. If we think about motor neurons as the as the frontier between neural behavior and function, uh, we can see the, uh, this kind of this this layer as the out, outcome layer of of a complex nervous system, which is the central nervous system, and and we can think about motor neurons as being um, particularly interesting uh, sets of neurons because they receive inputs from many different structures or circuits in the central nervous system and also from the from afferent inputs from the periphery. So that means they receive uh, quite numerous uh, sets of inputs from many different places, and they react to that in a, in a given way uh, for the different muscles that are being activated in a given task. 
So this may provide us with, um, with a way into the activity of the central nervous system, and this is an open question that can be uh, tested. And, and this is particularly interesting, again, as Sylvia was discussing probably yesterday, because uh, we're currently having more and more reliable ways of decoding activity of the, uh, of the motor neurons, the spiking activity of motor neurons as muscles contract, and with more versatility because we, we, can, we are now currently having more technologies that allow us to decode activity in the presence of dynamic contractions. And also we have advanced methods for training um, different types of frameworks for decomposition that um, uh, foreseeably they are going to allow us to decode in the near future with quite uh, big robustness, different uh, frameworks of muscle activation and motor neural activity. So uh, in this context, uh, most of the studies that are being published regarding uh, the um, characterization of motor neural activity in the context of certain uh, behavioral states are mainly focused on the idea of characterizing the level of activation of muscles and trying to come up with ways to map that kind of activation with the control of different devices, like for example, prosthetic control, controlling virtual environments, or trying to figure out ways in which we can neuromodulate different parts of the, of the central nervous system to facilitate motor function in patients with, with lesions, like for example, spinal cord injury. So in all these cases, what we try to do is we, we try to characterize motor neuron activity in a sense that uh, we, we try to estimate the level of activation of, of, of muscles and the, and the characteristics of activation of these muscles in terms of how they produce different types of forces and how they allow us to move, right? And um, however, uh, uh, we, we have quite a bit of evidence uh, of the fact that muscles are not only receiving activity uh, that determines how they contract and thereby how we move, but also they receive other sets of inputs that here are referred to as node space inputs, meaning that they don't contribute to, to muscle contraction and force production, but instead they travel along the central nervous system and along the motor neurons and muscle fibers without causing any effects, any apparent or direct effects on motor, fun on motor function. Uh, in this bottom plot uh, in the middle, which is from, uh, from a recent article by Sylvia, uh, this is a very graphic example of how we can see that uh, there's quite a bit of evidence of um, different types of activity that motor neurons are reacting to or, and they are um, jumping in a way that is falling outside what we call the motor band in the sense that uh, when, we, when we model muscles uh, and how they produce force based on the different inputs they can receive, we can think that uh, muscles due to their biomechanics, they are only going to be reacting properly to relatively low frequencies below 10, 12 hertz. And anything that goes above this base bandwidth is likely not going to have any direct effect on contraction. And instead, uh, it's going to have, um, it's, it's going to be basically traveling along muscle fibers without having any direct effects on function. And, and we can see when we have access to large enough volumes of motor neurons, that there's quite a bit of activity in different bandwidths that can, can be present in, in sets of, of motor neuron pools, uh, while we record different types of contractions, in this case, as, um, a sustained contraction. Right, so the question is how we can act, get access to these uh, so-called motor input and uh, non-motor inputs and how we can make use of them to make inferences about ongoing activity in the central nervous system uh, in a way that then allows us to use these peripheral recordings for, for example, estimating neural states that can be targeted with stimulation. <clears throat> so this is important because uh, for quite a long time we have evidence, quite consistent evidence, that uh, the descending pathways that connect the brain with the, with the, with the motor neurons in the muscles um, are heavily entrained and show quite strong um, um, modulation uh, of their activity based on ongoing activity in the central nervous system and in the brain, which means that the connections that are uh, present between the brain and, and the periphery are something activity that relates to ongoing activity in the brain. So that means that uh, there's this, we should expect to have quite strong uh, inputs in different frequencies related to ongoing activity in the central nervous system that are somehow uh, reaching uh, lower motor neurons, right? And, and if we want to model how this information is going to be traveling, we can think about um, these descending pathways, uh, particularly the corticospinal pathway, that are going to have many different actions traveling between the, the 
different cortical areas in, in the motor neural entrance. Uh, and they are going to be transmitting all sorts of information they get uh, uh, driven by and travel. And this information is going to travel along these uh, connected pathways that are going to have different latencies and, and transmission capacity. If we, if we want to model this um, in the way I have uh, drawn here, we can think of this kind of transmission as a, as a transmission of multiple versions of the same signal for a given signal, but this also applies to different frequencies or components that are being transmitted, but by uh, the standing uh, optical spinal pathways. And this, in the end, is going to be linearly combined at the entrance of motor neurons. So what's going to happen is that what we should expect at the entrance of motor neurons is going to be a certain version uh, of, of a linear transmission of, of ongoing activity in the central nervous system that is transmitted by these pathways. And the delays with which this information is going to be arriving at the motor neurons and the amplitudes or strength with which it's going to be modulating motor neurons is going to depend, depend quite heavily on, on the frequencies that are being transmitted and obviously on the characteristics of this information upstream, right? Um, so what's interesting in this case is that we have recently been able to show that this kind of activity travels, uh, seems to be traveling uh, along the, the fastest, uh, well, Actually, it seems to be traveling along all sorts of pathways that connect um, uh, cortical structures and, and motor neurons. But what happens is that due to natural cancellation of different versions of this activity that is transmitted with different latencies, in the end, what we, what we end up having at the, at the entrance of motor neurons and what effectively drives activity of motor neurons is a version of this ongoing activity in the central in the brain or cortical areas that uh, travels throughout through the fastest pathways that connects the, the cortex with the with the periphery. Uh, this can be seen here in this plot on the right, in this plot on the right where we show um, what is the latencies with which um, oscillatory activity in the beta band travels between the brain and the muscles compared to uh, the latencies with which uh, motor evoked potentials, which are um, uh, uh, synchronized volumes at the motor neuron level that are evoked by transcranial magnetic stimulation on the brain and that are supposed to be uh, pretty much determined by, by the fastest con uh, pathways connecting the cortex and the brain and the muscle, sorry. So we can see that the latenc latencies are pretty much uh, aligned, which means that uh, this kind of oscillatory activity travels uh, due to this cancellation effect that we were describing before. Um, in the end, it, it effectively travels through the fastest pathways. And what this means is basically that when we look at the activity from the motor neural level, uh, what we're actually seeing is, um, is, a, is a version of ongoing activity at the cortical level that has been uh, transmitted with, with a given latency that is probably going to be fixed because it's going to be determined by the length uh, that connects uh, of the pathway that connects uh, these two structures. And this connection is going to be quite stable for any given frequency that we are going to be looking at, which is quite interesting because that means that we're going to have a, a stable system that is linearly transmitting information with a fixed latency between the, with the between the brain and the muscles, right? Then, uh, uh, how likely is it that with this um, linearly transmitted inputs to the motor neurons, uh, we are able to extract them from motor neuron activation? Well, uh, to answer that, we can either solve that kind of questions either analytically, and there are quite a few papers uh, published by, by Dario and others where they have tried to solve this using integrated and fire models of motor neurons. But we can also simulate this uh, and, uh, and see how much we can extract from the inputs to motor neurons based on the activity they present for a given action. So here, this is a simulation where we have uh, a pool of motor neurons of 177 motor neurons that are driven by independent inputs, different inputs that are uncorrelated between each other uh, and drive the activity of each of the simulated motor neurons. And then on top of that, each of them are receiving a certain set of common inputs at, even, at different frequencies. Uh, and, and mainly two interesting, two potentially interesting frequencies that would re um, relate to beta activity and gamma activity in the brain. And we can see that when we simulate that kind of behavior and extract the, the spiking activity of motor neurons under these uh, circumstances, uh, when we then put together all this activity of the different uh, neurons and we extract uh, what's, uh, what's typically called the composite spike train, which is basically adding the activity or uh, striking activity of all these neurons separately, we can see that we have um, th this kind of system 
uh, pretty much linearizes and, and amplifies the activity that is common to all motor neurons. And this uh, allows us to pretty neatly uh, characterize the different inputs that are being received by motor neurons. And then uh, here I show you how these different frequencies that are being drive that are driving motor neuron activity in different colors we are representing different bands can be extracted back from this uh, spiking activity of motor neurons quite reliably. So you can see how these uh, blue, orange, and green lines are pretty much aligned. The ones that we simulated as the entrance are pretty much the same or similar to the ones we can extract from, from this priori nonlinear system because each of these motor neurons are going to behave in a nonlinear way, but that uh, all together uh, provide a linearization process that allows us to trace back the inputs that they, they were receiving in the first place. Um, so then moving forward, um, it's quite a bit of evidence of, of the links that are that exist and, and the tight links that exist between ongoing brain activity and muscles. So uh, these are two nice um, studies that have been recently published. Um, on the left, and this is a study we published uh, like one year ago where we were showing that when we identify ev events of beta activity, beta, we call them beta bursts, which are short events of hundreds of milliseconds, uh, where activity in the beta band increases sharply while subjects are doing a sustained contraction. And when we did that kind of processing on the brain level and then use that to do a spike trigger averaging, so to speak, of, uh, of the corresponding activity at the muscle level, we could see that there was quite consistent evidence of of matching activity at the brain and muscles um, in these bands that occurred pretty much at the same time when these events were happening. And not only that, also when we were characterizing uh, the rate at which these events were occurring based on the recordings of brain activity, sorry, EEG brain activity, and on the activity recorded from muscles and how long they lasted, we could see that they were pretty much aligned, right? So we, we saw that the, the rate of occurrence of, of these beta bursts and, and their duration were pretty similar between the two types of signals recorded, meaning that effectively we were able to characterize some going activity in the brain from peripheral recordings. Um, then here on the right, this is a nice study that um, shows to which extent we should expect there to be um, signals that are decoded from, in this case it's force, but eventually it's motor neuron, that are related somehow to, to ongoing activity in the brain. So in this case, what they did, this is a very smart uh, paradigm, I believe. Uh, basically, they asked subjects to hold a sustained contraction of a given force, and they uh, they were de delivering uh, auditory stimuli every so often. Uh, actually, auditory or somatosensory stimuli, but effects were very pretty much similar. And they th then they characterized what were the uh, evoked effects of these stimuli at the cortical and, and peripheral level. In this case, the periphery was uh, basically force. And you can imagine, as, as, as I was discussing before, obviously force in high frequencies is going to be highly dampened by the characteristics of muscles. But when you uh, average a sufficiently large sets of trials, then you can start seeing some level of effects. And basically what they showed was that uh, when, the, when the subjects were receiving this auditory or somatosensory stimuli, well, uh, sust uh, sustaining a, a contraction, uh, they could see quite consistent evidence of changes in low frequencies and high frequencies in the EEG. And these were, uh, some of these were matched with uh, also related changes in the, in the force produced by subjects, even though they were um, instructed to keep as stable forces as they could handle. And, and, and this is again evidence of how how strong the, these non-motor inputs can be up to the level that they can even have some levels of effect uh, at, uh, at the force level, right? So you can think that uh, beta frequencies in the force uh, while people are sustaining a, a contraction are probably going to be negligible, but still they, they can be seen uh, in this kind of plots, re reflecting the level of um, desynchronization that motor neurons can have driven by these cortical inputs, right? Uh, we are currently working on, on some similar results that are about to be submitted for publication where, where we have tested uh, uh, similar paradigms where we have people uh, holding a sustained contraction and, and trying to react to, 
to, a, to an imperative stimulus either by producing a force or remaining still, depending on the kind of stimulus they are receiving. And the idea with this was to, was to test, again, how strong uh, the, the mo how strongly motor neurons are driven by, motor, uh, by, by cortical inputs. In this case, when subjects, it's quite well established from the literature that when subjects are preparing for an action and then canceling it out, uh, there are very prominent uh, changes in specific bandwidths like beta and gamma bands that modulate activity at the cortical level. Uh, however, these kind of experiments are typically done while subjects are relaxed and then they either move or not. And the only way in which you can characterize these activities by, by recording uh, cortical activity. So here, what we did was replicate these kind of experiments while subjects were sustaining a contraction and we could characterize uh, large enough volumes of motor neurons during this uh, condition. So in this case, uh, we were able to decompose uh, around 30 uh, motor neurons on average across subjects. And we were characterizing the different frequencies that, be, that were sampled by these populations of motor neurons in the context of uh, preparing for the, for the specific action that they had to perform and then canceling it, uh, or actually not, per, not, not performing it, but simply canceling the, this prepared action and remaining still until the end of the trials. And what we see here is that um, pretty much aligned with our recordings of brain activity, which is on the left uh, columns here and here, uh, activity at the motor neuron level here on the right uh, showed quite consistent evidence of changes uh, in in the beta and gamma bands uh, that were related to these states of uh, action preparation, uh, which is uh, in this case from minus one to zero. This is the period right before the stimulus that determined whether they had to move or not. And then we could uh, observe quite strong evidence of increased activity in these different bandwidths showing evidence that uh, motor neurons were able to sample this information uh, quite neatly. <clears throat> uh, so just to sum up all this um, information that I was uh, describing now about the possibility of using motor neuron activity. Uh, so uh, yeah, muscles contain information in different frequencies that are not directly related to motor function, and they may provide a a resource to characterize ongoing activity in the central nervous system. And this information can be quite neatly sampled and amplified by motor neurons when we can uh, extract large, large enough volumes of motor neurons uh, receiving common inputs in different frequencies. This information uh, travels between the central nervous system and the muscles um, in, in sort of quite stable ways uh, with minimum delays for a given pathway. Uh, and not only that, they, 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 they can also provide us with a resource to characterize activity in different structures of the nervous system, so we can characterize that. For the moment, we only have evidence, of course, of ongoing activity in the cortex, because that's the kind of activity we can record with existing technologies. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do to, to see how much we can uh, advance in this line of understanding the different inputs that motor neurons receive and sample, right? Uh, and yes, so next experiments, and I think Alejandro will describe this a bit in his presentation, uh, have to prove how much we can use this information in real time, for example, to characterize ongoing changes in the central nervous system and use peripheral uh, recordings as a surrogate of ongoing activity uh, in the brain and other in the, in the nervous system. Uh, so in the end, this is our goal, uh, which is trying to record activity and use it as a surrogate of ongoing activity in the nervous system. And there are still some challenges that we have to sort out, and they regard uh, the different aspects of motor neuron activation and muscle generation uh, that we, at the moment, don't know about. So for example, we don't know how many sources we should expect to have at the entrance of motor neurons, and therefore we we don't know what is the level of complexity of uh, disentangling the different inputs that are, motor neurons are going to be receiving and are going to be driven by. Uh, we, we also don't know what are the characteristics of these different inputs that motor neurons are receiving from different parts of the nervous system, and therefore we don't know how likely is it going to be that we are able to separate them using either spectral separation techniques or other types of separation methods. And also, we need to uh, keep advancing in in the, the in determining the amount of motor neurons and, and the level of accuracy with which we decompose them in different frameworks, either dynamic contractions and so on and so forth, uh, that allow us to provide uh, reliable estimates of this activity that modulates uh, 
uh, the inputs to motor neurons and and that we can extract from surface recordings. So this was pretty much it. Yeah.